Alright, so ladies and gentlemen, hello, we're getting started, this is being recorded right now, I'm just gonna remind you of that. Alright, so, um, last Friday, last fr Friday's video, the link is here, I just added the link this morning, uh, because there were some technical difficulty during the during the day um however i think the video was the video was a bit like you if you go onto my uh, youtube page it was there but then i just put the link here just now okay um a couple of things i'm going to now Yes, uh, on Friday, I gave you guys the crossword puzzle. So the answer to the crossword puzzle is there. So do make sure you check and see if you got the questions, uh, got the things correct. Remind, as I remind you, I use a lot of the questions. I, uh, I, I use a lot of stuff from last year's chapter seven quiz for this crossword puzzle. Um, over there so um i've also put the homework answer here to uh, friday's homework are there questions about friday's homework you okay before that yeah. okay so before that okay the homework link to the one before we're up there. However, I think I didn't put the homework answer to three, three, one, three. So that's the one that you have, you're wondering about. Three fifty-five. So the an link to the answer is here. Have you seen the? Have you looked at it? It doesn't make sense. Okay, so let's go open that and just quickly double check. So three five five. Let's take a look. Number six. Both salamander and dogs have long tails. White bear. Wild bears do not. However, both bears and dogs have hair. Wild salamanders do not explain why a long tail is not an evidence uh, that dogs are more closely related to salamanders than there are bears. Explain why having hair is a good evidence that dogs and bears are more closely related uh, than dogs and salamander. I think before looking that, we both, I think from our previous unit, we put know that. We know dogs and bears are both part of the mammals. So in this case, and the other one, it's not. So we can, that should probably be helpful, but let's see. So the textbook answer they gave was three animals we will consider tails is a primitive trait while simpler and more, many simpler and related organisms have tails even bear have a small tail so we can't use it as this trait for grouping so in this case uh yeah so it's just the idea that tails there's so many animals including other things that have tails so we can't use tails as a specific criteria to categorize um uh, dogs and Salamanders versus dogs and bears. Does it make sense? Or? Yeah, sort of, because they're saying that like most animals have tails, so you can't use that as a grouping mechanism. Mm -hmm. I think, do you remember the dichotomous key when we're doing the dichotomous key? So you have a general grouping, you have a criteria, and then you have a general grouping. And then as you go progressively, further you have more and more specific things right so in this case you can say there's a lot of organisms or a lot of uh, species that have tails but then once you get past that level 
we look at more specific ones, then dogs and bears and other mammals have hair, uh, whereas hair is and fur is not really that part of it with uh, salamanders. Does it make sense? Yeah, so having hair is like more specific evidence? Yeah, more specific. Yeah, if you go back to the whole uh, Daikon Whiskey example. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Yes? I just had a general question. You know the like, um, Weinberg equation we were watching about yesterday in the Technically, could we use it to figure out all the genotypes and phenotypes in that the high, um, die high breed? Die hybrid cross? Uh, keep in mind the uh, was a Hardy Weinberg uh, equilibrium. You're assuming there's no evolution, so you're assuming no evolution. But if you think about it, there's like you have a P and a Q. So basically, you only have two different. Um, if you think about two different alleles, so it's really a way to use real life data, and it's more like monohybrid in that situation. Right. Technically, with the two PQ one, two PQ one, you're talking about the heterozygous. It's more of the monozygous hybrid, but in the heterozygous uh, information, right? If I were to break down for it, do both of them with two things. For example, with if I took one of the things that the monohybrid using that, and then Another one in the demo hybrid using that. And then if I were to multiply it, would it still give me all the possibilities? Or I think perhaps, but I think uh, that is helping you to figure out the allele frequency. So you are comparing that to like <laughs> real world data, whereas Pundit Square is dealing with probability, right? Okay. Yeah. So I think one is you're predicting what will happen. The other one is like you're using what ha what you can see to figure out what happens. Okay. Yeah. Interesting question. I haven't really thought that through. thought about in that direction. Other questions. Okay, so not astronomy. Now, what we're going to be talking about today, we are going to be talking about uh, speciation. Okay, We're going to talk about speciation. We're going to be talking about, um, namely, the mechanism of speciation. Mechanism of speciation. So last Friday, we were looking at natural selection. We were talking about the different direction of selection. Of natural selection, we talk about uh, sexual selections, about how female are the one usually picking the mates, as well as the interspecies competition between the male and the male. Uh, we also talked about oops, we also talked about genetic drift, bottlenecks, uh, genetic bottlenecks, as well as founders' effect. And we ended with the Hardy Weinberg principle. Or in the video to talk about equilibrium. So today we're going to be talking about speciation, which is we're talking about how the mechanism of how do new species get formed. Because tomorrow we're going to talk about patterns of evolution, basically how what kinds of evolution that we can see, as well as mac, uh, macro evolution. So this next uh, tomorrow's lesson is built on what we're learning about today, the mechanism of how species, new species get formed. Okay. So the note is a little bit lighter, so to speak. Uh, however, we will be talking about uh, there will be some questions, as you can see. So quickly look over here, speciation. So when we're talking about speciation, we're talking about a really time-consuming process for a new species to be formed or evolved. Typically, you need some sort of isolation. Okay, 
you need to have some sort of isolation. We're going to talk about what kind of isolations there are. Okay, we're going to talk about what kind of isolations there are. Now, viable offspring, basically, in no way, think of it as alive and actually fertile. Okay, alive and fertile. Yes. What was the S word thing? Speciation. Yeah. Spe actually, the title of this speciation. Okay, so speciation, a process lengthy in time for new species to be formed or evolved. So some sort of isolation is needed. It could be geographical isolation. We will look at that a little bit later on. But we will also see, uh, as you can see, we're going to talk about five different kinds of, no, eight different kinds of reproductive isolating mechanisms. Yes. Usually, isolation is required. Isolation is required. Okay. Now, so we talk about two, we're basically two main mechanisms, okay, two main kinds of mechanisms. You have Prezygotic mechanism. So basically, you're trying to prevent the male and the female to mate or have a zygote, have a fertilized egg, so to speak. Technically, a zygote is like a step after fertilized egg. It's kind of between that and uh, between that and marula and blastosis and those, all those things. And post-zygotic mechanism is, okay, the male and female did mate. You have a fertilized egg. What are the things that will stop this fertilized egg to becoming a fertile offspring? Okay, so there are two kinds of mechanism. Yes. We're not talking about what we're trying to do. We're tra we're talking about like, uh, in terms of speciation, we're talking we're describing almost like a natural process, like in nature. Species are being new species are being formed. So how does it work? Because you have in order for to in order for new species to be formed, there has to be like reproductively isolated from each other. The males and females from those prospective species can't mate to produce fertile offspring. So we're describing what are the what are the eight different ways that it happens. We're not talking about uh, I mean we can talk about like some kind of uh, may made uh, intervention, but we're not really talking about that. Okay. How are we doing? 
So the first, the first part, and I'm going to go one at a time. Okay. So behavioral isolation. We're talking about mating rituals. Okay. Mating rituals. Most species uh, that do sexual reproduction do have some sort of mating ritual. So the male will attract the female. Usually it's the male attracting the female. The male will attract the female to mate with him okay bird songs for example would be a type of mating ritual now why you guys are writing this? How many of you guys ever saw it? It's a relatively old video. Um, like the male and female bird of paradise and the male bird of paradise doing this funny little dance. Uh, how many of you have seen that on planet Earth? That's like, oh, what? Okay. Very few people from the other class also seen it. So because of that, we're going to watch it. All right, so this one. Okay, what happened? Why is it? Okay. So this is the rainforest. Oh. The bird calls. I'm <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. <laughs> it is very interesting. You're like, wow, that's really into the personal space. It's funny. It's funny. All right, so different mating rituals. If it doesn't, if the mating rituals are differ, they probably will not mate. Temporal isolation. We're talking about mating seasons. Okay, most animals do have a specific mating season, where during that period of time. Um, both male and female will be in heat and they will send signals to each other to mate, okay? Um, an example that I know a little bit more would be deers, white-tailed deer. So white-tailed deer during mating season will release a certain scent which attracts the male to go to that area. Uh, males also make a lot of uh, do have certain behaviors like certain, uh, I think, rubbing their antlers against the tree. I think either that or that's typical. Um, and that is also a scent way to mark their, his territory. Okay. So, and also, if also not just the scent part, sometimes if the female is actually not in heat, um, a lot of times males wouldn't be able to make it in that situation. Yes. Pheromones, or is it just time? pheromones? Yeah, pheromones. Um, so mating season will be one one example of that. Sometimes it doesn't necessarily need to be mating season. If somehow the male and female develop into like a nocturnal versus daytime kind of animal, then in this case, chances are the mating would not probably work. Okay. Geological isolation. Okay. So geological isolation, we're talking about like treetop versus ground level, like in the like in the video earlier just now. Okay. So one of one type of species live on a treetop, spend most of its time on the treetop, and the other one spends most of the time closer to the ground, then chances are they're not gonna cross path. Okay. So behavior, mating ritual, temporal isolation, mating seasons, ecological different habitats, uh, mechanical, basically if the parts even fit or not. If the parts can't fit, then they can't. if the male and female part don't fit. Yes. Of oh, different species. Gametes isolation. Now this one, it's more uh, whether the male gametes can actually recognize and fertilize the female gametes. Um, because for the male gametes to fertilize the female gametes, there's a number of process, at least in humans, that needs to happen. I don't know anything about the other animals. Uh, so in this case, if that process can happen, like the male gametes can't recognize and fertilize the female gametes, then uh, of course it will not have a fertilized egg. Sorry, say again? So for example, I'm only using human example. So for human example, uh, once the sperm managed to meet the, the egg, 
you saw the egg have a number of layers on the outside and before the sperm can actually go in, fuse with it, and uh, inject its uh, genetic information. So in this case, whether and for these ha things to happen, you actually need the surface of the sperm and also the surface of the egg. There's a lot of proteins need to recognize each other. It's like a lock and key mechanism. So if the key can't match with the lock, then you won't be able to, for the sperm won't be able to inject its or fuse its uh, genetic information with the female uh, uh, chromosomes. Usually, I talk about that in grade 12. Okay. How are we all doing? Are we good? So, if the male gas doesn't recognize... Then it's, then it's pre-zygotic mechanism. There won't be any uh, fertilized egg. So, this here, these five recycling mechanism so we're talking about five different things mating rituals mating seasons or timing habitats whether the parts fits or not and whether the male gametes can recognize and fertilize the female gametes if any of those is a no then it is a prezygotic isolation okay prezygotic uh, isolation are we good? Now, in terms of post-psychotic mechanism, so the, the male and female manage to mate, and they actually have a zygote. They actually have a fertilized egg. What can possibly prevent them from having a fertilized, uh, a fertile offspring? A couple of things. Zygotic mortality. So basically, you're talking about really the genetic difference between the male and female gametes that the zygote won't, the fertilized egg or zygote won't develop. Okay. So some species of sheep and goat, according to textbook, um, yeah, even if you try to mate them, the zygote won't develop. Okay. The embryo won't develop into an embryo or further down. Now, so zygotic, you're talking about the fertilized egg not developing or the zygote not developing. Hybrid inviability, you're talking about, okay, fine, the zygote did develop. However, however, due to some genetic reason, um, either it would die before birth or it can be born alive, but then don't usually live long. Okay. So according to textbook, if you try to cross tigers and leopards together, again, I don't know why. <laughs> Typically, it would result in either a miscarriage, so which is a pretty early stage, or stillbirth. Okay. Uh, my wife come from an area where there's quite a bit of uh, farming going on. And uh, her uncle, who used to raise cattle, <clears throat> actually said, yeah, there was like one time we got this thing. It looks like a moose have made it with a cow and whatever it is. Born alive, but didn't survive long. So that would be another example of hybrid inviability. Yes. Would an example of hybrid inviability be like the blood type example on the package from genetics? The one where the blood type interacts with the mother. 
the arch factor? I don't think so, because arch factor, you are talking about these inviolable, we're talking about different species, right, Emil? I think uh, with the arch factor, that's, I won't really consider that to be like a prozygotic mechanism, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, does this also apply to like colonial and like dog Uh, dog. Sorry, say again. Does this also apply to like Dolly? Uh, no, Dolly is a different issue. Dolly is, I would say, like, Dolly is a different issue because you're trying to clone the same, you're cloning within the species almost. You're cloning really that one individual, but you're using uh, eggs from other individuals of that same species. So all three sheep in Dolly's uh, experiment were from the same species, just three different sheep. Okay, um, we are what we're talking about here is like different species, male and uh, females from different species. Okay. Yes. Zygote mortality, genetic difference resulting the zygote not developing or not developed. So some species are sheep and goat. In terms of hybrid fertility, we've been talking about this over and over again, like mule. Yes. The zygote developed. Yes, it got born alive. Yes, it grew into adulthood. But guess what? It's sterile. Can't make kids. Okay. So again, we're talking about different mechanism we're really describing natural mechanism that prevents the male and female from different species having fertile offspring yes all hybrid species that survive to maturity are they all infertile or is it possible to have like a hybrid that can like make another hybrid make another hybrid <sighs> you asked a very good question here and this is actually where the definition of species there are a lot, there are cases where like definition of species do break down. So for example, uh, coyotes and wolves and coyotes and dogs. Yeah, definitely actually all species within that canis genus can reproduce, cross reproduce and produce fertile offspring. So this is one of those like weird situation where like, yeah, our definition of what is a species it's not perfect. Yeah. Yeah, there is a there is a number of situations where like um, I know in York region area there's a number of reporting of like koi dogs. Like koi uh, coyotes have made it with people's dogs and now like you have these things that looks like a dog but i don't know size wise but there's it's still it's still quite dangerous um, and in the northern ontario i think even northern ontario i think in some prairies provinces you have this issue of like koi wolves of coyotes mating wolves and so you have these things are bigger than a regular coyote still smaller than a wolf but works in packs and whatnot. So yeah, it's that. Uh, yeah, again, our definition of species is not perfect. But we're gonna use what we, we we're just gonna use what we have right now in the textbook. Okay. But good to know that in the back of your head. Questions. Okay, so there are these mechanisms of preventing male and female developing uh, fertile offspring. Five of these are before the zygote can be formed, and these other three other ones are things that prevent zygote from developing into fertile offspring. Now we're going to talk about two different types of speciation. Okay, so we are talking about allopatric. Allopatric. I think that's how you pronounce it. Basically. There's some sort of geographical isolation. Geographical isolation. <clears throat> uh, 
Now, this here, the diagram is not showing that well because unfortunately it's black and white. I'm going to use the... So if you look at this here, originally you have one population, one group of insects. And then there's some kind of geographical isolation. Now, this could be many things. It could be a natural one, like a volcano activity separating the landmass. We could have a river forming somehow between them. You could have a man-made uh, isolation too, like a highway being built and cutting the whole area into two halves or two, two uh, sections. So as time goes on, these to separate the population will develop differently, evolve differently. And later on, even if you bring them back together, they might not mate on its own. Okay. So that would be uh, what we call allopatric um, speciation. So again, can be natural volcanic activity or river formation, or it could be a man-made situation a very common one would be like a highway cutting across so the highway cut across and male from one side can't necessarily or female can't go across and mate with the other side safely Questions? I'm just zooming in the word. Can you guys read it easier? What is the uh, highway? Example, highway cutting across. Highway cutting across. An area. Are we good? So, allopatric speciation, we're talking about separation because of geographical uh, isolation. You can also have what you call sympatric uh, sp uh, speciation. So, it happens with the same geographical area, but different species. So, in the textbook, you, you can see this here two different color apples kind of thing, lies, fruit, uh, lies laying eggs on it. So according to the textbook, page 339, there's these kind of fly called hawthorn fly. So before they were, they're natural to North America. They're natural to North America. However, after apples were introduced to North America, some of these flies choose to lay eggs only on apples. And after a number of generations, you get these called apple maggot flies. Some of these flies still only lay eggs on the hot. And so you get two different species of flies. Yes. Hashtag? No, I I I I misspelled. Oh, okay. I misspelled. I, I was like, th was like, wait, it doesn't start with th. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Anyone know what this fruit, this hawthorn? Have you guys ate it before? Any of you guys? How, how does it taste? I don't know. I never had it before. I, I, I read it, but I, I, I'm going to Google it right now. Apparently, it looks like crab apples, but they're actually berries. 
So, yeah, apparently it looks like this. It's supposed to look like it looks like a crab apple, but it's not a crab apple. I see them all the time, like after like in the summer. Like, like, you know, one of these is the Virginia Yeah. Where? Yeah. Where? Virginia Beach. I never gone to that Port Union beach. Maybe I had, but I wasn't like paying attention a, to do. There's like a railroad and then, the oh. path, and then there's just like a resting area. But then if you go a bit down the dirt part, you'll see one of the trees. Okay. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Apparently it's, what is it? Here's a picture with like that with the leaves. So might be able to help you tell. No, Hawthorne. Yeah, <laughs> well, it does look like mistletoe, but yeah. Um, yeah, but apparently it's not the same as crab apples. Okay, it's not the same as crab apples. Yeah, small thorny tree produce edible red berries, somewhat resembling crab apples. Not the same. Yeah, so it's quite sour. Yeah, actually, now the type of apple and the fruit there, there's two types that are edible. There's like the orange Oh, yeah, I remember. I remember seeing it, seeing it fall to the ground and <laughs> smelling it. Okay, I didn't find it. No, one of them has a medicinal use. Oh, really? Because there's a spot, it doesn't very much, and there's nothing in front of the rest of the salt. And I found out that there's two edible types of apples. Huh. But there's a lot of poisonous stuff on it, you know? Oh, really? Oh. Like, not the apples, it's just like poisonous plants. Well, probably. Okay, any questions? So, two things here. Of course, there are textbook questions. Um, but, the homework. So you have textbook questions for homework as well as a seven minute videos, okay, on speciation on the unit planner. Um, tomorrow we're gonna be talking about patterns of evolution and macro evolutions tomorrow. So any questions? No? Okay. So I'm gonna stop recording now.